Hi all, today um, for the first time on my channel we talk about, uh, directly at least, about Roman history. And, um, and I would like to introduce um, <coughs> the, um, the figure and especially the government policies of the, uh, of the Roman Emperor uh, Diocletian. Um, it's very strange for me to, to pronounce Diocletian in English because I had to check out the, the actual pronunciation because to me it's always... Uh, I remember always the Latin name that uh, was Diocletianus as a matter of fact since you are largely um, <coughs> an English, um, at least an English speaking uh, audience I will use the, the English one but uh, um, forgive me if I, <laughs> if I say Diocletianus uh, at a certain point. Um, and um, why do I talk about Diocletian? Well, um, <coughs> I'm not really going to make uh, a lesson of Roman history, or, or at least this is not my, my, uh, my aim. Um, uh, I talk about Diocletian relatively to the um, the importance that um, uh, his reforms and, and his rule had for, um, let's say, m preparing in a certain sense, the uh, pave the way to um, what we call um, medieval society. Mm? This is something you find essentially in every in every manual uh, at the introduction of uh, uh, the, the medieval era. Uh, from the um, the late Roman Empire, because undoubtedly the figure of Diocletian set uh, uh, through his reforms um, part of that um, uh, you know medieval uh, society asset that we're usually conceived to have been the proper of the Middle Ages, um, and uh, and therefore. Um, it's um, it's indeed an important chapter in order to understand the um, <coughs> development, at least, um, of the uh, late Roman, uh, late antique, and early uh, medieval uh, period. So I will make also a very brief introduction, a very si simplified introduction to Diocletian um, in this uh, in this function. Now, first of all, uh, a bit of historical um, setting here. Um, Diocletian is basically the, the, the last emperor of a series, um, uh, you can consider him at least as such, of the so-called, um, you know, um, Illyrian, um, Illyrian emperors. Um, the idea, in fact, that uh, you know there is an end with Diocletian at a certain point of the the crisis of the third century, um, that uh, that had seen the rise of these um, 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 Illyrian generals that had become emperors on um, uh, thanks to their military um, military prowess and um, and achievements. Um, is, is, is substantially correct. You can uh, conceive even Constantine in a certain sense on, on the path of this and we can't, we, we can never draw a very precise line, but generally speaking it's a very good idea and, and Diocletian's um, <coughs> policy has to be understood on light of this. Um, at the, uh, in the central uh, decades of the third century as most of you, I presume, already well know, uh, the Roman Empire um, underwent a very, uh, very strong crisis that was triggered by um, various factors. I'm not going to discuss them extensively, but basically, you know, there, there was uh, an economical contraction, um, a political crisis, um, epidemics and uh, invasions that all together um, being causes and consequences one of, of the other um <coughs> brought the Roman Empire to a situation that seemed to be hopeless at a certain time um, relatively to the same uh, survival of the empire and um, and this is being historiographically speaking conceived as a very dark moment that starts essentially the, the decadence of the Roman Empire. I made 
a video, incidentally, a very uh, few days ago, regarding you know the the idea of decadence. Maybe without repeating myself, you can check it out. Uh, it wasn't much of a decadence. Um, it was a crisis. It's better. It's better term and there definitely a moment of transition. Um, the the Illyrian emperors um, rose to power during these um, decades for, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the social one, the idea that um, uh, that uh, the um, uh, let's say that the usual um, the, the provinces of the empire from which usually the, the, the majority of the legendaries during the uh, the the uh, the early uh, principatos uh, came from had sort of gentrified they had got their citizenry that they, they had got wealth and they didn't want to join the army anymore Illyria instead was an area a relatively uh, a relatively poor area of the empire uh, with um, a population that lived largely, you know, in, in very, um, very harsh conditions compared to, you know, the, the wealthy Italy or Spain or Africa or Gaul, and um, and s and 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 since, um, furthermore, the um, the the recent invasions of the empire had uh, occurred in part and in big part on the Danube uh, frontier on which Illyria was located um, <coughs> and a series of other factors the um, you know it was a, an increase of Illyrians joining the Roman army and making a uh, career through the ranks and eventually coming to you know uh, make sort of mutinies and taking you know the out uh, from from Rome and taking the control of 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 the of the armies and um, eventually dictating the, the the policy of the empire and um, a, a sort of decadent uh, idea regarding these semi barbarians com barbarians conceived always you know from the Roman point of view of the time we don't think of them as barbarians um, uh, has in fact you know left a sort of uh, of, of stigma towards these um, these Illyrian emperors that kill each other uh, quite often they had very short r uh, reigns um, and um, and overall they seem to to embody is, uh, the, the, the in fact the decline of the empire but telling the truth the um, the Illyrian emperors saved the empire um, they they were quite skilled military men and uh, therefore also politicians uh, in some measure and and it was thanks to them, and especially to to the, the great emperor Aure uh, Aurelian uh, Aurelianus in Latin, that was con uh, recalled Restituor Orbis, which in Latin means the re um, you know the the reshaper or at least the the one who repristinated the the world the world conceived as the the empire to its to its glory, to its power, uh, were you know some of the uh, the most important political figures of the time, and Diocletian uh, ruled um, uh, at the end of this set of emperors from uh, 1200. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, 1200 doesn't feel like that. <laughs> we are in the low Middle Ages. I meant 284 to uh, 300 or uh, 305. And um, <coughs> and um, the problem at the, the time of the rise of Diocletian also was acclaimed in emperor by the army, so he uh, he seemingly could be a very similar fellow to the one uh, who had preceded him. Um, 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 he um, he he tried essentially to find to to find a an adequate response to the. Uh, political, um, administrative, and the economical, social uh, plans um, to the crisis of the empire. Because yeah, the Illyrians had saved the empire, but surely the crisis of the third century hadn't done uh, hadn't done <laughs> much good to the to the structure of the empire. So this was felt by Diocletian as a moment of great. Um, uh, in, in, of, of, of in which it was necessary to, to
to achieve a great renewal, um, uh, a great um, uh, um, new uh, organization, etc. of the empire, etc. and uh, and therefore he um, he began to 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 uh, to operate a series of reform. That is what uh, that is what we are going to talk about today. Um, meaning, I'm, I'm s specifying this because um, Diocletian was also very good general. He fought against many peoples, but we're not going to make um <coughs> a military history of here. We, we it's mostly a civil and administrative and political history here, um, because it it's uh, it's equally important than. One day we might even talk for sure about the military campaigns of Diocletian, um, and um, the, the the general line, um, political line of Diocletian was um, uh, achieving uh, the total control of the state, um, which might sound strange <laughs> to our modern ears in the sense, oh yeah, that was like the usual dictator uh, <laughs> who wanted power, etc. Yeah, you can argue something like that. Surely these aren't wearing angels, um, but uh, you know, given the situation of the empire, and there is a huge historiographical debate, uh, we will be seeing that it was perhaps a very good response, and uh, <coughs> there would be too much to to say, <laughs> telling the truth regarding to it today. I, I really want to make things simple, but it's difficult to do it. Um, on Diocletian and Constantine, also because um, we don't know effectively very much about what happened in those times. We still, for instance, there is a, a great confusion uh, sometimes between Diocletian and Constantine, um, essentially because we don't, we do not know uh, when cer who actually mm, enacted certain laws and certain reforms. So sometimes we we kind of uh, confuse them, um, but um, um, there is also a, a great historiographical debate, as a matter of fact, on the differences between Diocletian and Constantine that maybe one day I will try to 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 approach, but not now. For now, let's let's just say what Diocletian did, as a matter of fact, for for what we know. Um, he, um, as we were saying, he wanted a total control of the state, and and um, this is something you can achieve only if you have a strong base or, or strong premises I to do so. Um, he had a substantial strong power from a political and military point of view, but as always, a state has to function with money. Money really makes the world go around, um, and. Um, and 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 the situation from an economical point of view in the Roman Empire was was pretty serious, um, and um, and it was already uh, giving signs of uh, you know of um, of further uh, decline and and, the, uh, and which would have led to a disruption of society. Therefore, a strong action, strong political action was was felt to be needed. Um, and um, how did he operate? Well. First of all, um, this is what he's mostly remembered for. Um, he made everything as possible uh, to tie every citizen of the empire, which uh, today we, we, we tend to say, yeah, at this time so there weren't much more of, of citizens but subjects, uh, which is also fascinating, yeah, in some part, and, and, and such reforms tells you how this was carried out. Um, basically, he <coughs> tried to uh, and achieved uh, in, in great part to tie every um, uh, every single freeman to the father profession. Basically, uh, whether you were a peasant or an artisan or a merchant, um, you uh, were set into these frame for which you had to carry on on that job and your uh, sons would have had to, to do exactly the same. Um, what was the, the, the aim of this? Well, the, the idea, uh, consider that most of the inhabitants of the empire this time were peasants. 
uh, and that we're talking uh, in spite of the great development of Roman civilization of a still of a largely agrarian society. So such a reformation was w such a reform was very important because um, uh, the greatest con the greater consequence uh, of this um, was relatively to the um, to to what pertained to the rural areas and the estates that made up a Roman econo uh, economy. Uh, the aim was to basically tie the peasants who in spite of being free, because they were conceived as freemen, not as serfs, to the uh, working land. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was happening for a reason, because substantially this very strong um, and political uh, and economical crisis had, um, had made uh, mm, a lot of people fleeing from the country to the cities. Think of all the wars, etc. Roman cities were generally walled, they could be better defended uh, wha when you know these mm, you know there were invasions from enemies whether they were barbarians out of the frontier or even the same Roman armies most of the time uh, it was easy to flee um, the country also because these countryside ha had been devastated and the Roman the Roman world at that time was was still um, you know capable with its wealth of uh, feeding large uh, numbers of people in the cities who were given the, like this minimum um, food uh, was normally bread sometimes even meat quite rarely but you know there were these large food uh, allergicians from the state that <coughs> by the way were usually paid by privates because this was a um, uh, by private uh, people, because this was a way, especially for the rich, to tie more, uh, more people to their um, uh, clientary, uh, clientary system, etc. So very clever things that uh, what has studied Roman history knows, um, <coughs> and um, and um, and therefore a lot of peasants had fled from the country to the cities. And this obviously had created more problems because of all these immigrants and then the, the problem of feeding them. And uh, and it was uh, a cause of, of consequences for which, you know, there, there wasn't, there weren't enough resources for ev everyone. So Diocletian thought well to tie the peasants to the land in a way that, that he could say, okay, maybe this is limiting their freedom. This is maybe creating discontent. We're, we're really making, um, uh, carrying out a process of, s of social engineering that, that we, as Romans, had never conceived before, at least now we are, we are obliged to see things in this way, because the same society has already changed, and, um, and therefore granting, uh, through the, 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 the peasant work on the land, um, a fiscal income, because this was really the problem. Um, if you, you know, uh, have people who work the land in a certain place, um, they are traceable, they are uh, quantifiable, they, um, you, you know, you can know how much they produce. Also because these peasants normally lived in other people's lands. So, uh, w when I was saying that, uh, you know, medieval society is starting to, to, to kick in, in this, uh, from these reforms, it's actually because um, here we begin to see what would have gone on for great part of the early and the high middle ages for for other centuries that is the process uh, the progressive um, you know um, uh, you know sub submission of freemen of or, or at least of, of people who were originally freemen to certain masters to certain lords the, the 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 Roman term dominus that is uh, lord essentially master uh, something in fact that remains uh, in the medieval Latin vocabulary because the society that was created here was was essentially being replicated the dominus existed since a very long time in Roman history telling the truth it doesn't really start from here but here um, we have a um, uh, strengthening of uh, um, of a stratification of social stratification mm, and of great um, social and economical and political inequality that would follow especially from from the time of Constantine 
Diocletian sometimes is conceived as a as someone who tried more or less to to um, who wasn't so um, decisive uh, decisive in abandoning the the ancient um, uh, you know system. Also, uh, through his monetary reforms, he tried you know to 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 hit the bottom of what possible in order to to insist on on, on certain political lines and he only partially reformed the situation. It's with Constantine that, that things really take another path, but Constantine was a great, um, a, a really great man. Diocletian was as well. Um, as a politician, as politicians, I mean, of course, because they weren't, m <laughs> they weren't really very tender people. Um, and um, so, through this system, you could have, you know, the, uh, the state having uh, at least uh, assured a certain tax income. Mm -hmm. So maybe less safe tax, but you know, uh, le uh, I, I mean less taxes, but um, part of them on a safer ground. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and, and this idea of, you know, tying, you know, of, of kind of crystallizing society uh, on you know on on the base of professions on on the idea of where you had to work um uh, etc and the subtle control of this was applied also to the urban world so the professional associations uh, the corporations essentially that that existed within the roman cities and then most of the times really made the 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 art of the um, the political and economical system of the cities were um, were also um, you know um, mm, mm, you know uh, uh, controlled uh, you know re uh, reformed and uh, they they had to obey certain certain rules and and remaining fixed the way they they were so, so w with a much higher statal inter statal intervention on on them. Um, there was um, also um, uh, there were also certain ceiling prices set uh, both for the um, the the goods um, and of the of the uh, salaries obvi obviously, um, which however was uh, very difficult to achieve because you know the economical situation wasn't you know that controllable from from the uh, the states uh, of the time let's think that you know compared to our days um the roman um states uh, taxes had been usually very low a very low percentage of of taxes imposable on on the whole society it's however in this moment that um the 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 fiscalism of the roman empire starts to grow increasingly because these reforms needed m more bureaucrats to w to work, uh, more administration, etc. And uh, and this would have consequences, all obviously, also on the management of certain provinces, especially Byzantine fiscalism. Sometimes is used uh, during the the early and Middle Ages to to even uh, explain certain um, behaviors. For instance, why. Uh, certain um, certain lands of the Eastern Roman Empire abandoned Constantinople uh, during the Arab advance and preferred even the uh, the Muslims as as rulers since they were Christians because they because the Muslims would make them pay much less money than one than what Constantinople um, wanted um, and it starts really from here. In fact, you know, the, the same idea of the Byzantine Empire, etc., starts essentially from here, from Diocletian or Constantine that uh, uh, eventually made Constantinople being built. Um, and um, the and you can argue that um, you know we're skipping a lot of things because otherwise this will get too long. I promise I will make. A much deeper video for each of <laughs> Diocletian's reform to explain things better. But let's say that overall, the, um, Diocletian's reforms were quite energic, and they they couldn't um, you know uh, respond to all the problems of the empire. But let's say that in 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 a certain measure they were able to stem um, 
to stamp them. And at least the the more emergent, uh, um, you know, the greatest emergencies were 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 stopped, were were partially solved. And uh, although the crisis itself didn't didn't stop, because as we will see after Diocletian, it would be a, a you know another series of uh, political instability and civil wars, and so problems didn't stop. But uh, generally speaking, you know, um, you know, especially from the economical point of view, things were set a bit better, mm -hmm. and uh, on the short term, these would. Um, um, these would even um, trigger uh, um, a certain recovery mm, from the, um, the 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 previous decades. Um, and um, thinking, of talking about um, uh, Diocletian's r uh, reforms, we cannot avoid to talk about the main constitutional reforms. I mean, the uh, the creation of the so-called tetrarchy. Mm. Um, and um and, and di let's really see how how it started first of all together with this uh, greater increase of the state um intervention in uh, in the affairs of 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 uh, you know the the, uh, the citizens uh, life um uh, very heavily uh, also sometimes there was in parallel the um you know the ex the exaltation of uh, imperial authority, mm, uh, especially stressing the sacral prerogatives of uh, of the emperor. Mm. The Romans, traditionally speaking, um, had never they, they were quite of um, an egalitary uh, society for the ancient world uh, standards. Uh, meaning that obviously the, the the Roman Empire and even the Roman Republic have always been um, an oligarchy, mm. so always the richer uh, have uh, have ruled. However, there was, like in other uh, Indo-European peoples, um, within the the, the Italics and, and consequentially the Romans, this idea that uh, there couldn't be a king. Mm. Um, the same Roman kingship was something that came from the Etruscan model that was not Italic. Um, and uh, you know the the great um, political virtue that was believed to be at the base of the Roman state was this idea that um, all Romans, um, as Roman citizens, um, would be equal, at least the ones who had the uh, the full Roman citizen. Um, and therefore, um, even during uh, you know the the end of the Republic and the birth of the Principatus or Principatus, better said in pronunciatio restituta, the um, the Augustan um, uh, regime had um, had maintained, despite of f the fact that that, that Augustus had created uh, a monarchy. The the idea that you know this monarch, the the princeps, would be somehow, uh, you know, elected uh, in harmony with all the, the 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 Roman citizenry as this chief that obviously already had you know um, at the time an idea um, ideologically speaking um, a particular uh, relation with the gods etc. But uh, the Romans had always refused the idea of, of of a monarchy essentially at least from 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 a formal point of view um, and 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 it's with Diocletian that the principatus ends and uh, the so-called dominatus begins the dominatus it's essentially the shifting from the princeps so the prince so the etymologically speaking the first among equals like Augustus was to the Dominus, hence the master. Mm, that is something very different, um, and and therefore Diocletian's um, empire marks this, um, you know, this passage from a republican ideal to a, a definitely monarchic ideal that would be at the base of the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire, as you want to call it. Um, till the very end of the same uh, Roman Empire uh, in 1453 under the the canons of the Ottoman Turks. So this idea that the the, the emperor, the Roman emperor, was uh, you know um, 
a sort of absolute monarch, essentially, um, and uh, and that therefore everything has to proceed from him. So political decisions, the protection of the church, Diocletian wasn't wasn't a Christian, but eventually, um, you know, with Constantine at least, uh, Christianity begins to be uh, the major uh, Christi uh, the major um, Roman religion at, at the end of the fourth century. We will have the um, Christianity as religion of state in the Roman Empire so even that starts from here and also the law for instance I mean if uh, if an emperor decides I want to make uh, you know this new law it had to be accepted so this authoritarianism and absolutism was born formally um, and, and uh, was formalized at least by uh, Diocletian um, and, um, and and these sacral prerogatives, so even the idea that uh, you had to kneel in front of the of the emperor, which w which was uh, a typical mm, Hellenistic thing used by Alexander the Great, who was imitating Persian models. This some that was something that at the time of Caesar of Augustus would have been inconceivable for a Roman citizen. The so-called proskunesis in Greek. Uh, which means, in fact, this idea of, of kneeling in front of someone, you know, as if that was, in fact, your dominus, your master. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and these sacral uh, prerogatives, prerogatives were uh, preceded, pre, um, you know, prepared, uh, ideologically speaking, the main uh, constitutional reform of the tetrarchy. Mm -hmm. It was aimed uh, to uh, assure uh, a tighter control of the imperial territories and especially of a, uh, to solve the problem of the uh, succession, mm -hmm. which had been uh, always uh, a weakness of the Roman system, probably the greater one set, uh, one of the few faults that the Augustian uh, system uh, had set, the idea that you know, there wasn't a dynasty, so theoretically, you know, every time uh, an emperor died, nobody knew who had to rise to power, and, and especially who was, you know, who had to push for for for, for putting I him into power. Technically, it was the Senate, but mo most of the times in practice, it was the army. And the crisis of the third century had uh, had seen the exasperation of of of, of this problem uh, of the succession. Um, so, um, what does tetrarchy mean? It, it comes from Greek as well. This tells you, by the way, how many Greek, uh, you know, how you know, increasingly more Hellenic from 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 the Latin origins uh, the Roman society was, and how you know the empire was progressively shifting towards the east. Tetrarchy means uh, from. Um, it, it, it comes from tetra, which in, in, in Greek means um, four. So it was an, an arche, um, which means, um, you know, uh, rule, empire, essentially. So it was um, a government of four mm, people mm, that uh, was in fact introduced as a constitutional reform by Diocletian, which conceived the, pre the presence of two Augusti, so two Augusts, and um, who were comforted in their uh, in their um, office uh, by um, respectively um, uh, one Caesar each. So two uh, um, uh, Augusti and two uh, Caesari um, or Caesars in, in English. Um, and um, and the objective of this was the idea that the the August the Augustus had uh, a merely imperial power, um, especially uh, aimed to to m to administrate wisely in the Augustan tradition, etc. And a Caesar who was normally younger, who had to be uh, the Augustus' successor, so he had he would have uh, had to 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 become uh, Augustus himself at the death of the Caesar. Um, and was destined to succession, who was more of a, you know, of a, of a military office. Uh, this distinction actually was there uh, also in, in um, during the uh, the principality, during the, the princi principatus, because normally the 
uh, you know, the the preferred, the favored successor, uh, often the, the son, for instance, of the emperor, was sometimes named Caesar, mm, you know, respectively to, 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 to the emperor who was Augustus. But this was sanctioned for the first time as the, um, what would have had to be theoretically because as we will see it will fail miserably the successory uh, system. Um, so um, it had been established that the Augusti would have left the throne after 20 years from their settlement. S uh, so this is quite interesting because it was um, there was also some kind of moral uh, intent from Diocletian. We, we don't have to forget that the Romans were pretty uh, pretty stern, pretty uh, Spartan, and uh, you know, uh, morally, you know, um, sensible people. It was especially in public ethics that permeated the whole Roman society. Mm, the idea that things had to function for the common good was was there essentially. So even these, it's very interesting to 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 see th that Diocletian. Uh, himself at a certain point after the, the time that he had set for his rule, he would abdicate and retire to private life. So this idea that uh, everybody has to obey to the same rules and they, that there don't have to be excesses and, and that this um, 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 co new constitutional asset would have to sanction a, a period of peace and of stability and prosperity, but it was a mirage. Uh, it's also very interesting to make a parallel into history that uh, the uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles the V in the 16th century wanted to do something similar with a, with a very vast Habsburg, uh, Habsburgic empire by making the sovereigns of Spain and of Austria shifting even um, you know office essentially shifting throne in order to maintain the, the Habsburg um, empire. Uni uh, unity, but uh, it obviously didn't work out. And even um, Diocletian Tetrarchy didn't work out. So definitely a model that, historically speaking, doesn't hold. And um, um, also because I this is a general and very subjective consideration, I believe that if you have too much power, you tend to abuse it. Um, unavoidably, <laughs> almost by definition, um, but here we go on. Um, um, so, um, it was also, uh, this is also interesting that the idea that obviously after that the, uh, the, the 20 years of reign, uh, the Augustus would abdicate, the Caesar would become Augustus, and the Caesar had, uh, and the, uh, the new Augustus, better, had to name another Caesar. Now, this is very interesting, so it had to go on and on. And, however, there was also a distinction between the, the two pairs of this tetrarchy, in the sense that the two Augusti and the two Caesars were, were not really equal. Uh, there was um, um, there was a gradation, essentially, because there was a first August, Augustus, sorry, <laughs> first August this month. A first Augustus, w therefore, was the the the, the most powerful one. Then it was the second Augustus in power. Then the th uh, the, the first Caesar and the second Caesar, mm -hmm. and and this was meant to do, however, to safeguard the imperial primacy. Mm -hmm. So the idea that even though the empire had been split, uh, the imperial mm, uh, rule had been split. Uh, there was always a single, um, a single emperor, and this is interesting because the Romans would keep till the very end this idea. You know, even when later the uh, the, the the Roman Empire would be split into uh, east and west, um, it, there weren't really two empires. I mean, the the, the in, in practice, they were because you know they they would even be in contrast uh, between each other. But uh, constitutionally speaking, and institutionally speaking, the the empire was conceived as one. The division was merely an, admi an admi uh, administrative one, and the two emperors would have 
um, the same uh, power, theoretically speaking, because it was conceived as a collegial office, as many, um, you know, and this was uh, also a, an ancient republican tradition of, of Rome, the idea that there would be cer certain double magistrates, like the consuls, who were elected um, to balance each other's power and to maintain, therefore, uh, a balance and equilibrium within the uh, Roman institutional sphere. Um, um, and, um, and 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 um, uh, the reform uh, would would be instated in uh, 293, um, um, uh, in the sense that uh, he um, he d and and this is very important. The the tetrarchy wasn't just. Uh, you know, a, a, a matter of office. It was. It, it actually brought to uh, a practical partition of the uh, the e the empire into geographical areas that had to be ruled by these four um, four guys, uh, which tells you, by the way, that the Caesar mm, Caesar's power wasn't that uh, subjected to the one of the Augustus. Usually, uh, there would be a sort of um, um, a sort of feeling and affinity between the, um, uh, the the two pairs, in the sense that normally the Augustus would, even for the fact of having named that Caesar, theoretically maybe saw him as you know he he had chosen him for some personal reason, some convenience of course from a political point of view but normally he he would be and hopefully he would be a man of trust of some sort but uh, in practice um, this guy was called to rule um, a fort of the empire that wasn't ruled w where the, uh, when the relative Augustus would rule another fort mm, that often bordered because um, also in here we have the division in um, in east and west that, that were divi divided in turn in in two, uh, according to the uh, the fact, the, the tetrarchy, in fact, and um, um, and um, and Diocletian chose um, his um, as uh, as area of government, um, essentially the um, the area, the third area from w the west, let's say, that was uh, uh, Bithynia, and and therefore Asia. Asia Minor in, in great part. Uh, he um, he had his residence in Nicomedia, mm. while well, he entrusted the West to uh, Maximianus, mm, who was named in fact Second Augustus, who instead ruled from Milan. Mm. Um, it's very important to see how you know um, this is a moment in which the capitals of the Roman Empire are changing, because Rome. Um, uh, even after Constantine uh, founded and, 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 and took his and, cr and, and created his, his court into Constantinople, um, Rome was officially still the capital. Mm. It had always um, you know less power, but it was still a hell of a city for, for those uh, days. Uh, and it was important politically speaking. But um, the capitals that that you see here um, in, in these um, in these years um, had mostly a military importance. Mm? It's not that that Nicomedia was more important than Rome, or Milan was m more important than Rome. They were very important cities indeed, but they were especially from um, from a strategical point of view. Um, the the, the word basically four capitals all set into strategic locations um, Trier, Treviri in Latin that is in today's Germany at that time it was in Gaul because it's from the other side of the Rhine um, I mean from the, the let's say the, 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 the left side of the Rhine uh, which was a very important um, uh, center for you know obviously the Germanic frontier then there was Milan Milan was incredibly important because it's, it was the ski of passage from the Mediterranean, uh, I mean from Italy to Gaul or to Germany, uh, so a, a very important passage point even through for going east towards Illyria, mm. a very important city uh, from that point of view. 
Then in along the Danube you had in the Balkans um, Naissus or Serdica, I don't remember. I think it was um, um, the, the prefecture of um, of of of, um, of the bulk of Illyricum was um, was maybe uh, I'm, I'm checking it out. I don't want to to make a no. I think it was Nisus. Yeah, I think it was Nisus also because. Um was by the way the, the city where, where Constantine was born. Uh it was very important, however, along the Danube frontier, which was quite unstable. There were a lot of peoples from the other side that, that pressed um uh for the you know uh the uh, on the bo along the borders and then you had Nicomedia that was uh in the in Turkey, in today's Turkey. Uh, in this very important area between the Black Sea and the uh, Aegean Sea, and a uh, key of passage between Europe and Asia, and uh, and 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 it was also relatively uh, safe from the eastern frontier, but it could um, uh, check it from there. Uh, then eventually Constantinople would replace Nicomedia as uh, you know, not just for the political importance, but uh, at the moment of its creation on from from the strictly strategical meaning that it had uh, that it had um so it's important even to give a spatial um you know picture of the idea um and um as i was saying uh, um he um and uh, at this point um um Diocletian by the way entrusted um he he made um on this re on, on this quadripartition also the um um you know um he, he gave uh, he flanked this uh reform with an administrative one in the sense that geographically speaking the empire had to be um administrated uh you know from certain specific centers and um the imperial administration had to be perfectly uh, squared <laughs> in this sense because up to that point telling the truth the provincial um, um, the, the administration of the Roman provinces had always been quite um, you know decentralized we have the idea that uh, you know the Roman Empire the peak of its power was a sort of place where you know with the the Emperor snapped from Rome everyone from Britannia to uh, from Scotland to 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 the Indian Ocean would obey to, th to the Emperor. Telling the truth, the local governors most of the times were essentially ruling on their own account, at least uh, in practical terms. Um, and this had brought, incidentally, also many of the problems that were seen during the, the crisis of the 3rd century, meaning that many provincial governments had basically r uh, risen against the central authority and Diocletian reform of 297 um, was aimed exactly to reform the administrative um, um, uh, frame of the um, of the imperial provinces uh, by giving um, you know uh, uh, by increasing the, the central control on 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 these and um, and of those four cities that we mentioned before so Tre uh, Treviri um, um, um Milan and uh, and and Naissus and Nicomedia uh, he established uh, four prefectures mm -hmm. so they were called um the prefecture of of the east was Nicomedia who had its center in, Nic in Nicomedia the one of Illyricum in the Balkans uh, was of Naissus of Italy uh, was Milan and of of Gaul was Trier mm -hmm. And um, and in turn, he uh, subdivided these prefectures into dioceses, um, in th which were twelve, all in all, mm, which were in turn articulated into one hundred and one provinces. Now it's very interesting that you find these twelve dioceses that incidentally corresponded already to broadly to 
to a picture that would have followed the um, would have been followed by the same um, Christian church in the sense that these dioceses uh, were set uh, like in the Roman Empire that was an empire of the cities in urban centers and the urban centers were the um, the place where Christianity mostly uh, had spread mm, at this time at least um, and uh, and therefore since obviously with the decline of the empire especially in the west etc um, I it's very interesting that the Christian bishops would take uh, the with uh, alongside uh, the decline the, the decline of the statal authority they would start taking the administrative authority of the dioceses um, for themselves from the ancient Roman administration and this is very important also because here we're talking about Diocletian but um, just after him Constantine would essentially entrust the local church churches w within the dioceses of administrative tasks in parallel to um, the ones of the um, of the, the 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 state the Roman statal ones um, which tells you already how you know society was was changing in many ways and and how much Christianity was were was rising to power mm. so you see that provinces are smaller than dioceses in this administrative system and that tells you you know how much the the empire had changed at that point um, so uh, the dioceses however were entrusted um, and they had a, a usually um, more than else, um, uh, a judiciary and fiscal um, uh, function. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the guy, uh, the Roman officer entrusted with this task was called the, the so-called vicarius, mm -hmm. so the vicary. Mm -hmm. While the uh, provinces, uh, w which uh, as we have seen, were were increased in number, were 101. The, the Roman provinces originally were much less, but were much reduced in extension, also because the empire was not enlarging. Were entrusted to a uh, dux. So um, the dux is a title that uh, stands for military leader, mm. and in fact, I it had military functions. And uh, in and and close uh, to the dukes there was a preses, uh, which instead had civil functions. Preses is the same word as pres from from which president comes. Mm -hmm. So someone who presides a place for for civilian matters, and that tells you, re especially uh, relatively to the dukes, how um, also the local uh, military um, administration uh, was being. Um, um, you know uh, how capillar it was. I mean, every single province had to have a military commander there, put by the state, who had to you know respond of central authority uh, in this sense. So you have to understand that all these reforms brought to uh, a huge increase of um, statal um, uh, expenses. Uh, especially in order to make all these um, of the administration work, th um, it was a huge. Uh, it was created a huge, uh, a new huge um, bureaucratic body, hmm, which kept increasing. Um, and in fact, um, you know, most of the criticism relatively to to this uh, late Roman model was it was corrupted, although. Uh, because you know, uh, seemingly corruption was uh, is the problem of, of bureaucracies. But telling the truth, you know, considering the previous Roman age, you know, corruption has always had, al had always been there. And this system, telling the truth, by large, worked. And especially in the East, um, during the Middle Ages, it kept existing because basically the Byzantine Empire was this. Uh, the continuation of this bureaucratic state set by uh, Diocletian's and Constantine's reforms. Mm. 
So all this beautiful system put up by Di Diocletian is often criticized. People say, well, it couldn't hold. You must wait for Constantine to set things uh, definitely right, at least from the you know the the definitely settlement point of view, and the turns that history uh, was taking. Um, however, we must see that what we want to we got to admit that what Diocletian did was a pretty um, amazing feat, mm -hmm. and uh, it tells you how much Roman civilization at that point was still alive and capable of renewal. That is very important in history to to see how much a society is responsive, um, you know, and. Uh, uh, and a uh, civilization can adapt to new challenges and 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 much of what Diocletian said eventually survived as well uh, during Constantine and his successors. However, when in, in 305 to um, Augusti, um, in application of the reform of the constitutional reform, abdicated um, for the Caesars, so the first time, there were immediately huge difficulties and. The sons of the Augustian of Caesars, for instance, didn't accept that. Mm. Uh, they didn't accept to refuse to the succession. And that tells you, by the way, how how weak this idea of tetrarchy is, and um, especially um, under the light of the uh, of the fact that um, this late Roman society was an increasingly clientelar society, meaning that. Uh, if if you were at the top, like Diocletian, for instance, or one of, of the other tetrarchs, you would have um, a huge personal power, a huge private pl power, as a dominus and as uh, you know, as, as someone's master. We're talking about world provinces depending from your private money, and obviously, if you have a son, you want uh, him to to <laughs> to 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 go on and. If for some political gaming like the one that Turkey could could present, uh, you know your son wasn't you know chosen to 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 uh, f for for the next office. Well, he would essentially inherit at your death your 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 clientele, your your army, because there were largely private armies at this time, uh, in spite of the fact that yeah they were formerly the Roman army, but it, it, they were still moved by, uh, by, by the clientels and the political influence of the single, um, um, of the single warlords, um, and that would immediately trigger civil war. And in fact, here you see that uh, you know Diocletian left his office. He 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 made his beautiful um, palace in Split in Croatia. It's a beautiful place if you ever go to Croatia and visit it. Um, you, you can immediately spot that it was a pretty much fortified. It was a bit too much fortified for being just a retirement house and that tells you how much Diocletian actually um, in spite of abdicating formally was necessarily in contact with the the political reality of the empire, and though he wanted to present himself as a sort of a, um, of a remote observer of of the uh, results of his the political system that he has set, but r um, you know the the harsh truth was uh, was another one really, and you see that uh, there was. A there was a military, there was a war essentially, uh, in which Constantine and uh, another general, Licinius, um, prevail. Mm -hmm. And they would rule uh, jointly with the, ti the respective title of August Augustus for, for each one until 324, when uh, eventually Constantine um, rose to power as unique leader but that that is another story we will be seeing that another time so i hope that this video was enjoyable oh my god i've been talking for an hour i didn't <laughs> i didn't uh, check the time but i hope uh, to have said enough i wanted to be an introductive um video about diocletian reform um 
I, I, I think I summarized everything I wanted. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did it, uh, please share it or leave a like or subscribe. Please to, to my channel if you want to receive further content. And uh, if you have any question, please leave it in, uh, in the comment and via email. I will answer you, perhaps with a dedicated video if I have the time. And, um, and as always, I thank you again very much for, for listening. And I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye!